you. Thank you, Ariel. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me here today. I've long worked with the uh, with the uh, Greenwich Village Society, with Andrew Berman, and with many of the members over the years. And here on the Upper West Side and in Hell's Kitchen, we have many of the uh, gentrification and construction and destruction of landmarks problems as you do in the village and NoHo and SoHo. So we, we have common cause uh, in a lot of ways. And I, I enjoy working together with groups like yours that are most effective in uh, challenging uh, the status quo. Um, I'm happy to be uh, just giving a small introduction before uh, our main act. Um, I've worked, um, I've been an assembly member for 14 years. And while my work is always centered around advocating for the most vulnerable, um, COVID-19 pandemic has shown a light like no other uh, about problems that we know have been in existence. We have known about the vulnerable among us. We know that the safety net is full of holes, but COVID-19 has brought it all into sharp relief. Uh, thousands of people have died in the state and across the country, uh, thanks to the ineptitude of uh, the president. And it is still ravaging our nation. Um, it was just reported that 5.4 million Americans could lose their health insurance when they need it most. And others are grappling with food insecurity. Uh, last year, a survey found that 40% of families didn't have the means to cobble $400 together in case of emergency. Millions are waiting for unemployment uh, benefits um, and many, many people cannot pay their rent. Uh, it's, it's a disaster, it's a catastrophe. Um, all the while, government has been trying to address some of those issues on the state level. Um, we passed a, a package of COVID-related um, bills uh, some weeks ago, and then we went ahead and passed some long overdue criminal justice reforms, um, spurred on by George Floyd's tragic death his tragic I can't breathe, which unfortunately has been all too common around the country. These acts have been happening. The police and other law enforcement have been vile at times to people who are black and people who are Latino, LGBTQ community. And it's now that bills that have been languishing have risen to the fore. So we've passed more protections. There's so much more to do. Um, but the fact is that racism is institutionally baked in. The system is working the way it was designed. And that is the, the outrageous part that people are just coming to grips with today. Uh, we see that in other states, people have to sort of pay a poll tax, or at least that's what Republicans are trying to do, prohibiting them from voting. And we see here in New York State, thousands of people were disenfranchised um, because of COVID and also no one was prepared for so many people to vote um, by, uh, by absentee ballot. They're still counting in some races. As a matter of fact, they haven't begun to count the absentee ballots, which are more, the number of people who voted by absentee is more than voted on that day and in uh, early voting. So. Our democracy in New York State needs to get up to speed, uh, and viewers should not, voters should not have to put their lives in danger to vote. I've introduced a bill that everyone gets a ballot automatically, and we don't have to beg and send in for our ballot. It's our right to vote. So I'd like to introduce the man of the hour, Jason Haber. I've worked with Jason Haber for many, many years. And he even inspired my legislation to remove Robert Moses' name from places and monuments across New York State. He's an Upper West Sider and um, he's a friend of mine and I hope you enjoy his words of wisdom tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Linda. And thank you everyone for coming out here tonight. What a, a perfect introduction and such, such kind words. Um, I'm going to move now to share my screen. We're going to run through a, a presentation for you, and then we'll take uh, your questions uh, at the end. 
um, sort of like we did when we were in person together uh, back in February, which I know feels a very long time ago. So I wanna talk tonight about what I see as the peril and the promise of this very unique moment that we find ourselves in. But as you know from my past lectures, I like to start with a bit of context and a bit of history. You know, before this virus arrived, New Yorkers heard reports it was coming. The news reporting on it was spotty. Some didn't take it seriously. Other warned that a catastrophe was in the making. And when it did arrive, it came by way of Europe. And the city would, would soon embark on a very ambitious program of contact tracing, public education, the closure of some businesses, the changing of some business hours when they could open, changing of rush hour, the creation of field hospitals, the encouragement to wear a mask. And when it was done, over 20,000 New Yorkers would die. But no, I'm not talking about COVID. The image that you see here on the screen right now is actually of the 1918 Spanish flu. And when history repeats itself, it is rarely a good thing. And in this case, it didn't begin with a bang, but with a whimper, with the arrival of this very ship, a Norwegian steamer, which came into New York in, April, uh, sorry, in August of 1918. And what's interesting is at the time, New York was very well prepared to handle the flu because we had a very good functioning health department. That winter, prior to this arrival, there were actually lower cases of flu than in, a, than in a typical year. And New York felt that because of their experience with tuberculosis, they were well positioned for the virus. But these thoughts were far, far from our mind on February 4th, 2020. I know it feels like a lifetime ago, which is the last time I spoke to your organization. We gathered without thinking about social distancing. We didn't wear masks. <laughs> and why would we? Because on February 4th, the World Health Organization issued an order saying do not restrict travel, that there was a better way to contain the virus. There was only one case in Belgium, one death in South Korea. There were no cases in New York. In fact, it would be, it would be several weeks until there was even one case in New York. I know it feels like a lifetime ago, but once the virus did start, I, this is actually a sheet that I created. And what I was doing was I was tracking the daily growth rates of the virus. I knew from past history, my studies in public health, that early tracking would show you just how quickly it was growing and how serious this could become. And these are the two week period that set us on the trajectory that we know and have regrettably feared. And you can see one day we were at 99%, 117%, 97% growth. To put that in comparison, today we were at about 0.13% growth, around 300 cases or so a day we're going right now. So a big change from where we were in a percentage basis in those early days. But it's important to note that as we were moving through this virus, we were changing New York in ways that we had never seen before in our lifetimes. We were seeing field hospitals get created, parking lots turned into morgues, our harbor turned into a lifeline for potential hope. We were reminded that heroes don't wear capes. We were reminded that we've also maybe seen this before because sometimes the past speaks to us in ways that we don't even imagine. But sure enough, the more we look, the more we find reminding us of what it was like then, what it's like now. This is a particularly tough shot to look at. This is in, in Kansas, actually. But you can see the comparisons here. And of course, this is a picture. This was, this was local and a particularly ghastly image. But the, few, the past suddenly doesn't seem that distant. This is Royal Copeland, who was our health commissioner at the time. Now, what's interesting to note about him was New York was much better prepared for this virus than Philadelphia and then Boston who were hit much harder. Why? Because New York took early and aggressive action. They did things in 1918 you would never think about. For example, they banned smoking in theaters. Remember, this is 1918. They launched a public awareness campaign. Now the schools were not closed during the pandemic. Why? In 1918, so many school children lived in unsanitary conditions, that the thinking was they were safer in the schools. And also the public health department, you know, before email, before social media, you had to get information home and mail wasn't as reliable to a lot of these uh, communities. So they used the students to bring leaflets home. And what kind of leaflets did students bring home? Well, they told their 
their families. If you had, if you were under quarantine, the milkman can't come in. You could be fined, and they people were fined, which was a lot of money back then, five to one one hundred dollars. And then the police, then, and you know the police today, and there are some things that don't change when it comes to police. That comes to police until they do. And we're going to get into that in in a little bit. This public awareness campaign, frankly, is probably easier to understand than the ones we've launched today. You've seen this. You may remember the president's 30 days to stop the spread. Well, first it was 15 days, then it was 30 days. Rachel Carson, as some of you know, warned us years ago about a silent spring. But in Carson's spring, it was the environment that went silent. And in this spring, it was us that went silent. I don't know if you can hear it. It's on Central Park West. The only sound that morning, this was in late April, were of birds. But that silent spring was then replaced by an angry summer, and rightfully so. And the cries for justice outweighed the sounds of birds. And those are the sounds that echoed again, that ricocheted over the last 100 years. And they're the sounds that take us back once again to the ending days of the Spanish flu. The sounds you hear are history speaking to us from those who perished in the last pandemic or by the police or other means. The struggle we're in now is not just with the virus of Corona, but also a larger virus known as racism, known and unknown racism that we're going to explore tonight as well. This picture, by the way, was taken, as many of you know, in Greenwich Village. This was on uh, Lower Fifth Avenue. And this was in 1920, the NAACP put this sign outside their building and they did it for 18 years until the landlord threatened to evict them. Somehow in New York, these stories seem to find their way back to real estate. But our connection with the past, with yesterday and today, yesterday and today, continues through our story. And then we look at the list of the partial lives lost and a partial list of lives lost by another virus. We look at the virus that's ripped through our bodies and the virus that's ripped through our souls. And the question that we have to ask ourselves now is what now? What do we do with this moment before us? What do we change? What do we keep? How do we think anew? For one thing, we often think of New York City or any city in this way, which is as a map, as a dense place, but as rock or steel and concrete and glass. And I would ask you tonight to think about New York in a different way. Think about New York as an organism in of itself, as a life form, because sometimes life forms get sick, they need help, they require care, and sometimes they die. And how do we make this organism that is New York City stronger and healthier and more just? So some see this now as an opportunity to get the city back on track, reopen, get back to how things were. But there is another way that I want you to think about tonight. And that way is to think about the city anew entirely. Let's free ourselves of not just one virus or two virus or multiple viruses. Let's look at all the things that have been plaguing the city as a whole and let's see what we can change. And so for example, I wanna talk about another virus right now. It's a disease which stifles our inhabitants, which promotes division, which isolates us, which divides us. It's the first one that I want to talk about tonight. And if you've been in my past lectures, you know how strongly I felt about this throughout the history of the city. What I'm talking about tonight first is our car culture and the streetscape design that has been put in place that puts entire emphasis on the car. And it starts right here in 1939. This is an image of the World's Fair. It's Disneyland before there's a Disneyland. People got into these little seats. They spun around a diorama. And what did they see? They saw the city of the future as proposed by the auto industry. And they got it. Eight lane highways, symmetrical buildings, boulevards of cars. 
It was free of congestion. It was free of density. It was also free of people. If you take a close look here, there are no people in this design. The planners hadn't even considered to think about them and to think about their importance. And that tells you a lot about the plans for the city of the future in the middle part of this century, of the last century. The designs were for cars, the car, the car, the car. And look at the advertising for cars. Look at the racism in the 1950s ads for cars. You'll see the people in there. It's very clear who the ads are marketed to. These are just two examples. I could have just chosen hundreds. If cars were marketed to white people, they were sold to white people, they were driven to white people. This was the autocracy of the age. And who was the autocrat that set the car on its path? We all know who that is, of course, from our past conversations, that's going to be Robert Moses. Now, in our conversation tonight, I wanna to talk about a different side of Moses. We know about Moses, the autocrat, who put the car above everything else. We know about Moses, his personality, his desires, but we should also talk now about Moses as the racist, not just any racist, a racist with unchecked, unfettered power to do as he wanted. What harm could that cause to communities of color, not just of one generation, but of multiple generations? Now in a democracy, this kind of power is not supposed to happen. This is how we design our government, at least we did before I started speaking tonight. Moses held most of these positions at the same time. At his peak of his power, he actually held 12 positions concurrently. What could go wrong, right? I mean, he's the head of the city planning commission. So he plans projects and then he goes and builds them as head of the New York City Construction Authority. This is not how it's supposed to work in a democracy, but that's exactly how it worked. And I wanna show you as a perfect example of that is Jones Beach. Now Jones Beach is considered a masterpiece People rave about Jones Beach. Now it's true. In 1929, no one had ever seen a public beach like this. Beaches like Jones Beach were set aside for the 1% of the 1%. Regular folks couldn't enjoy a beach like this near a city. But for who was it designed? For who? If you look at these early photos, of course, you'll notice people of color are not included in them. And that is by design. Now, before this presentation tonight, you may see this overpass and not think anything much of it, not think it's a sign or a symbol of racism when actually it is. And we know from Robert Caro's research that Moses intentionally built the overpasses at seven and a half feet, knowing full well that buses would not be traveling on them because they couldn't clear the overpasses and that would keep people of color out of his beaches. Moses had an expression about this. He said, if the ends, if the ends don't justify the means, what do? The problem is we must look at the means, at the how, at the why, and not just the end product, because how they got there and why they got there are extremely important. And also as a side note, has anyone ever been to Jones Beach by train directly? The answer is no. You've gone to Freeport perhaps and then taken the bus from Freeport. There was no direct train access to Jones Beach for the simple reason that he didn't want people of color traveling by train to his beaches. The Long Island Expressway, which many of you have been on, is also an example of Moses' racism. At the time, his own engineers begged him to install a rail line in the middle there, which you could see where it could have gone. Remember, Long Island was tabula rasa, right? It's blank slate. There, weren't, <laughs> there wasn't anything out there. You could have done whatever you wanted to do. He refused to put the train line right there, which would have opened up Long Island to apartment style houses, different sorts of communities all laid out on this, on this road and on this transit system, on a light rail system that he refused to do because he did not want Long Island to be accessible to anyone but, but white people. This is by design. And at the time it failed common sense. And today we look back and we can say it fails decency. But again, yes, he built the road. He built many roads. He built thousands of miles of roads. But again, at what cost, who did he build it for, and what was the end result? And by the way, this is what it would have looked like with a rail line in the middle of the Long Island Expressway. And when we get into housing, which Assemblymember Rosenthal spoke about earlier, his record is even more scary. You know, people talk about things like redlining, 
And I think today there's this impression that it was done on the, as an aside, that it was, it was done quietly, and that it was something people didn't talk about. No, no, redlining wasn't just hidden. It was out in the open. They had their own map. The red lines that you see on this map here are literally neighborhoods that they would go in and that they would red line. This was done on purpose. So banks would not lend in certain neighborhoods. And this was done intentionally also in the West Village, which believe it or not was redlined. Jane Jacobs once said, when she lived in New York, she had savings and could borrow from family members to move into their small house. We couldn't get a loan. Banks had blacklisted and redlined the area. People couldn't get a loan. You could have gotten a loan in the suburbs where for the first time loans were guaranteed at a 30 year return. You can pay it off over 30 years, that was new. So they're pushing people out to the suburbs and they're making it harder and harder to have home ownership in New York City. You know the results and what happened next. Moses also inflicts a lot of pain in private developments. Private developments before the 1964 Civil Rights Act, you have to remember it's a much different time. So for example, Moses shepherds the Urban Redevelopment Companies Act, which makes it illegal for real estate companies, sorry, makes it legal for real estate companies to exclude African-Americans from the housing projects. In fact, was this just, you know, Moses being a part of his times, a product of his times, as some people say? Well, you know what happened? 1,200 families organized and tried to fight to allow communities of color into these neighborhoods. And you know what happened? They were evicted or eviction procedures were launched against them. Uh, the head of MetLife simply said, who, who owns Town at the time, this is a quote, Negroes and whites do not mix. This is what they wanted. They wanted segregation, they wanted separation, and Moses set about doing it. Here's another example from Levittown on Long Island. In Levittown, they actually had a covenant in the rules which said you could only rent or sell to people of the quote unquote Caucasian race. This sets up for generations of segregation and of unfair policies that are with us today. This was from Sunday out in Long Island where an African-American woman is being harassed for moving into a certain neighborhood. This is with us to this day. And this starts with Moses. Now, what could Moses have done? People say, well, it wasn't his, he didn't, it wasn't his responsibility. He was just a builder. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Moses, with all of his privilege, with all of his power, if he was on the right side of history, he could have changed all of this. He could have stopped all of this cold. But he was a racist himself. He didn't care. And that's why things are the way they are today in many ways. He's the original sin. We live in his New York in so many ways to this day, not just in the city, but across the area. That's why I wrote this op-ed last year saying that Moses' name should be removed from all public works. Hopefully with Assemblymember Rosenthal and others can help get that actually changed and passed into law. You know, laws can be changed and changing a law is a really, really, really hard thing to do. Assemblymember Rosenthal knows that. I always love this photo. This is of LBJ signing the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And you can see that the eyes of Dr. King sort of making sure that he signs on the, on the line and that it's, it's done. But we know how hard it is to change a law. We know laws can be changed. We know that we just got the 50A repeal and we know that it's possible to change laws institutional racism is a different is, is a different animal altogether institutional racism some people feel and experience it every day other people's other people have no experience with it they don't even understand that it's happening because it can happen under the surface to them and that's what makes it so difficult where do the people of the bronx go for their apology for the cross bronx expressway where do the people of queens go for the BQE? Where do the people of Brooklyn go for the loss of the Dodgers? Where do the citizens of the world go for the loss of Penn Station? Which I never miss a moment to show the loss of Penn Station. Was the loss of Penn Station racist? The loss of Penn Station was in effect the end of an era, the end of the era of rail, the supremacy of the car, which of course is with us today.
And Jane Jacobs speaks about this and she says, there's a quality that's even meaner and outright ugliness and disorder. And this meaner quality is the dishonest mask or pretend order, achieving by ignoring or suppressing the real order that is struggling to exist and to be served. It's that real order, what really makes cities work that we lost, that we need to get back. Part of that system, that institutional racist system that's existed for generations, it includes the police department. It includes every agency, every function of government. And that's why the current system has failed communities because it's part of that failed system. Now in a functioning, thriving, fair city that's freed of institutional racism, police keep the peace, of course, but not in the way that we think about it today. And guess what? Jane Jacobs had something to say about this, which I think is exactly on point. The first thing to understand, she wrote, is that the public peace, the sidewalk, the street peace of cities is not kept primarily by the police, necessary as police are. It's kept by an intricate, almost unconscious network of voluntary controls and standards amongst people themselves and enforced by people themselves. This is exactly what we need to think about right now. This is exactly how we can turn things around where everyone's concerned about what's happening right now. Like I say, there are many people who talk about Jane Jacobs as a visionary, Jane Jacobs as an advocate. Here's another one for you. Jane Jacobs would have made a great police commissioner. And the way she thinks about things is exactly the kind of approach that we need now. When Jane Jacobs saw a broken window, she saw a community that needed repair, not a tenant who needed a summons. She knew that her street ballet, if it's broken, if it's robbed of its actors, that it would fail to function. And right now in New York City, the music has stopped and that function of a city and how a city self-polices and keeps itself safe is not working right now. And that is something that we must return to. As a side note, because people are talking about Jane Jacobs for some reason and broken windows right now, no, she would not have supported the broken windows policy. And if broken windows alone was so successful, why did crime drop in other cities where it did not exist? Just one note, the Times quoted that the big success of broken windows in 1994 was that it removed 41 squeegee men from the street. Just an aside. Now, let's look at what Jacobs did talk about. Um, Jacobs talked about a few things that she said would be key to any city. There are four points. Once, any building must have not just one, but two functions. Here's a good example of that, residential, retail down below. Blocks must be short to allow for interactions. So you get to meet not just one person every day, but you're coming into contact with all these different peoples and it keeps what we would call the sort of hustle and bustle of a neighborhood alive and well. And that it's okay for buildings to be of older vintage. Not every building needs to be Hudson Yards. Not every building needs to be brand new. Here you can see a mix to the left and to the right, a mixture of the old and the new. And density is important. Having people there, congregating, serving as the eyes on the street is very, very important. On our streetscape to now in the village, you know this better than I, the dominant actor on the streetscape is the car. For some reason, the car takes up three lanes on a side street, not on all, some that's just one because they're so narrow, but on most streets, the car is on the left and the right and driving down the middle. And maybe if we're lucky we get a bike lane on some cross block streets. Now, 90%, sorry, 95% of all of New York is free parking. Only 5%, if not less, is metered parking. So we have a tremendous amount of free parking. And you know, you know this as well as I, if you've traveled around, even finding those spots can be difficult because they're in such high demand, but it encourages people to use the car. And on streets like this, I don't know if you're safe on a bicycle. If I'm on a bicycle, I'll look for streets, side streets, cross streets that have, the, um, have a bike lane on them, not enough do. But it's more than a conversation about parking versus bicycles. It's all about what kind of city do we want. Listen, here's some quick math. You know, if you said, okay, well, we're going to charge, we charge $3.50 an hour for a metered spot. If you charge $3.50 a day for New York's free parking, $3.50 a day, that would raise almost $4 billion from the 3 million parking spots we have in New York. 
Now we have a budget deficit of nine billion, so that gets you one third of the way there. Not bad. Now I'm not saying that everyone's going to pay that. In fact, a much more fair way, of course, would be if you're, say, a rent regulated tenant, you can still park for free. If you're income restricted, you park for free. But for those who can afford, it seems like $3.50 a day to help us get out of our current budget debt is, uh, might be an interesting proposal to look at. And of course, the other way to look at it is, do we need both sides of the street to actually have car parking? Perhaps it's time to make it more sparse and to use, say, one side of the street as a dedicated two-way bike lane or create some other interesting opportunities for the streetscape. It's time to really think about redoing the streetscape as a whole. I know we've done a lot of work right now with outdoor dining as a result of COVID. I just want to quote from Jacobs here because there's an important point that I want to make clear. She wrote that Puerto Ricans who come to our cities have no place to roast pigs outdoors. And I think that's an interesting point about the push of gentrification and different cultures and communities coming here. I've heard so many times, and you've probably heard it as well, it's like Paris in New York. It's so great. And by the way, outdoor dining, very important right now, I get it. But if you're obsessed with having Paris in New York, I suggest you get on a plane and go to Paris because this is New York. In New York, we have much more diversity than they have in Paris. There are 637 languages spoken in our diverse city, including French. Now getting people outside, sure, it's important right now, but let's remember, not every neighborhood is like this. Some neighborhoods have dirty buses, they have diesel in the air, they have bad dirty air, it leads to asthma. So we wanna be cognizant of hearing from each community first, which I think is the broader idea here, is that for one community, their block party is another neighbor's 311 call for a noise complaint. Right now is not the time to be gentrifying neighborhood after neighborhood, and in fact, we should be doing the opposite. Now's not the time for displacement at all. Now's the time to celebrate the diversity of each neighborhood, to revel in it, to support it. Unfortunately, one of the unintended consequences of Jane Jacobs' own vision has been gentrified neighborhoods. And this is not just in New York, this has happened in, in parts of Washington State, over the West Coast, where they've looked at Jane's vision. There has been a big push to gentrify in those neighborhoods. And so what we've got to do much more of is celebrating those local communities, working in those local communities, and understanding that, um, that the folks who are there have to stay because the, the immigrant story in New York, which goes all the way back, we're all immigrants in New York, um, they're more important than ever. From 2016 to 2019, immigration in New York fell by 46%. This is important because they represent the backbone of the city and without it, the city is spineless and it will have trouble growing. So now we have lower levels of immigration, higher levels of emigration. And at the same time, you've seen all of these headlines, right? They're running out of town. They're never coming back. They're leaving. We've heard this before. You and I know that right after 9-11, after Hurricane Sandy, there's this knee-jerk reaction. Everyone wants to bet, for whatever reason, against New York. I think a lot of it is maybe it's cynicism, maybe it's jealousy. There have been a lot of these New York will fail stories. From what as I understand it, people, of course, did leave. We know the data on that. But I think you're going to see them return because there's only one city like New York. And I actually feel pretty good about the future if we seize the moment in the right way. Here's a map from Living Labs, New York City. These dots represent over a thousand vacant lots that the city owns. 1,000 vacant lots, over 700 acres of land that the city owns. No more selling to, for $1 for for-profit developers. It's time to invest into communities. And if we work with local neighborhoods on a plan for community by community that can address things like affordable housing, Maybe it's community centers, maybe it's health centers, maybe it's education centers. We have to work with each neighborhood to come up with a specific plan. If we do that kind of not top down planning, but bottom up planning, neighborhood to neighborhood, understanding what the needs are, these thousand lots represent a huge transformative opportunity if we use them well and if we use them, if we use them smartly. You know, everyone asks too, what's next for New York? Where do we go from here? And I think the decisions that we make today will define what comes next. I think it's up to us right now to say to our leaders 
and to act as a community to push for a more sustainable, affordable, and just city. And so we can make the cynics cry with New York in its next iteration as a better place than it was before. If we act together with force and with cohesion, I really believe we can do this, but it's up to us to determine that path. And I really hope that we choose wisely. Thank you very much for, for listening. Um, we're gonna open up, I think now to, to some questions and, and hear from you guys as well. Thank you so much for this. It's, it's so amazing. I feel like we've talked about Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses so many times and this is a completely new perspective. Yeah, um, it always comes, they come new again, I think. Yeah, and, it's, yeah. It's, so, it's so great. Um, we have a few questions, which I am glad to read to you. Sure. Um, <laughs> Richard wants to know, just curious if it took a while to find a photo of cops with masks on in 2020. <laughs> so yes, so I actually did have to look for it. And I think that's one of the problems, you know, there, I think there are two problems, two symbolic problems right now. And, I, and, and I'm so glad you noticed that because a lot of the cops weren't wearing the masks during the protests and, and still don't. So that's one. And the other one, which, which my wife noticed, and I want to give her the credit on this. So when the, after the budget was passed, the police commissioner went on TV and trashed the budget. He said, well, now it's going to hurt the police department. Now, I want you to understand something. He is the police commissioner. He is a commissioner. They're not an independent agency. Can you imagine if the parks commissioner went on TV and said, this budget's terrible. He works for the mayor. The mayor obviously supported the budget, otherwise it wouldn't have gotten passed, he wouldn't have signed it. There's a level of independence that the police department operates in, which is part of the systemic problems of the police department. No other police commission, sorry, no other commissioner of any other city agency would dare criticize the budget right after it was passed. That's their mayor who passed the budget. They work for the mayor. The New York City Police Department is not an independent agency. And it, 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 granted, it's an, important, it's an important agency, of course, but the commissioner is a commissioner. And I think it's a perfect example of this attitude that's been out there that they, they operate differently, that the rules don't apply to them like they do to other city agencies. And that is dead wrong. Hmm, interesting. Um, as a follow-up question, Richard also wants to know, which I, I didn't even know, did people wear masks in 1918? Yes. And, and was mask compliance greater then than it is now? That's a great question. So they wore, the, the, the reason that they wore masks, no one knew exactly how the, the virus, the, pen, the flu was spread, but it was spitting was the problem. So they mm. had this, these campaigns against spitting. There were a lot of tobacco chewers, so people would often spit. In fact, in New York, they had public water fountains at the time, and there was a community cup, so people would just drink from the community cup. Oh, wow. And obviously, that would spread the virus. The theory at the time was the cup was clean because it's constantly being washed by water. This is before they knew what was happening at the microbe. Oh, no. Oh, oh. no. <laughs> yes. So, um, so the mask wearing had to do a lot with helping people to stop spitting. Um, but there, there were, there were the healthcare workers wore masks. When you look at old photos in the all the wards, and not just in New York, but around the country, you see a lot of mat, you see a lot of mat wa mask wearing. It wasn't compulsory like we're trying to do now, like we should do now. But there were, there was a lot of mask wearing. Um, Ella wants to know. Um, she says, "I've I've read that what is referred to as the Spanish flu of 1918." was actually caused by the overcrowding of World War I US soldiers in training camps in Europe. Do you know why it's still called yes. the Spanish flu? So it's called the Spanish flu, which is a misnomer because it didn't originate in Spain. But during World War I, it was very difficult to get press reports out from the European nations because the world was at war. And so, but in Spain, there were reports out that first hit this country about a flu epidemic. One third of Spain got the flu, hence the misnomer, the Spanish flu, and that's just how it's been known uh, through the years. Mm. And yeah, so, so one of the things that made the Spanish flu so bad was that you had, you had troops all over the world, they were moving around, <clears throat> war ends at November, and then they come home and they bring it with them. So, um, so the war played a big impact in how Spanish flu was transmitted, 
it's interesting to note that the flu killed more people than the war did. Wow. Yep. 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 Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to jump around in these. Um, we've got a few questions that are sort of about what's going on right now. Um, mm -hmm. Lloyd has two quest two, two part question. Um, what is your opinion of our pool of May mayoral candidates for next year's election and do you think that further taxation of real estate is the only way out of our deficit sure so uh, i'll take that in two parts so uh, just by way of full disclosure um i am supporting scott stringer for mayor i think he'll make a great uh i think he'll make a great mayor i encourage everyone to do research and see how the campaign unfolds um, but i'd very much like to see scott as mayor i think he's the right person uh, to lead us forward and um, I, I, I will just jump in to say that village preservation is, is, is not, does not have a, a, state, a statement or an right. opinion on the matter. That's just my personal one. <laughs> my, my personal one. Um, and so um, the, second, the second question, um, read it to me again. The, yeah. the Taxation of real yeah, estate. So, no, I mean, listen, no, I think, I think that like the, I think for example, cars, are one example. I do think you could look at East River bridge tolling. Um, I, I like the, you know, we have, we'll have congestion pricing at some point, it may get delayed obviously with what's happened. Um, I, I, I think that there are lots of ways that you can raise revenue. I think real estate is one of them. Um, I think there are others too. Great, great. Um, Kathy asks, do you know about Scott Stringer's proposal about using NYC owned vacant lots for affordable yes. housing. Yes, I, I've talked to Scott about that. So it's a great plan. Some, someone else says, um, an, an, an anonymous attendee says, um, I love the idea, but how? Which idea? The, the idea of um, using vacant lots for affordable housing. Oh, well, so what happens right now is there's this process. So what's happened during the de Blasio administration, some of the lots were sold for a dollar and they were used for private development or quasi, uh, for for-profit or quasi for-profit or non-for-profit development. But I think, I, I think what you have to really do is, it, is understand what the needs of every community are. And I said this purposely in the lecture because it's not just affordable housing, it's, it's about the fabric of a neighborhood and what a neighborhood needs. So on a certain block, like the, the, the highest and best use for that community it may not be affordable housing. <clears throat> it may be a healthcare center because I, I think we're going to need more of those um, going forward. One of the things COVID has exposed is that neighborhoods that have less healthy access to, to foods and to medicine um, are more susceptible to diabetes and hypertension and thus are more likely to have complications from COVID. So I think you have to go by neighborhood by neighborhood. And I, look, I just think it's about setting priorities. We have all these lots and I think it's important that we use them. You only get one shot, right? And if you, if you, don't do it right. It, it hurts the neighborhood. So I think we should choose wisely and, and see what we can do there. Yeah. Um, so what can we do besides write and show up to meetings and, um, and, and, you know, what, what can we, what can we do to, to create change? Great. So there are so many organizations out there right now. Um, obviously the, I think the protests have been incredible and very inspiring. Um, we need to be electing candidates that we think that we believe in that we think can really usher in this change not just you know small change we're talking about like the hard stuff here like the really deep systemic work that needs to be done i think there are people who get that um i think if you're in the village you have a lot of uh, political organizations there are that you can get involved with um if, and if that's important to you and online organizing is going to be really important for the next six months because i i don't think you're going to see a lot of in-person uh, political work um, outside of the protests because you know you can't we can't gather like the reasons we can't gather tonight together hopefully we'll be able to my next talk but um, I think online advocacy is going to be real is really important right now that's great that's great um, are there promising and realistic proposals for no or fewer cars in the city which I've seen that Athens is doing this yeah um, other yeah. than charging even more for taxis, car services. Yeah, I mean, and I'm not, a, I'm not even a fan of that. I think we have to look at more private car use. 
Um, I think we have to can really think hard about that. And I haven't seen, they may be out there. I haven't seen a, any elected officials with proposals that are similar to mine. And in my last talk, I actually went into more detail. We didn't have time tonight, but I went into some more detail about some of the there alternate side parking, which I would change entirely. They're doing that now as a result of COVID. Um, but I, I think, I think you just have to change. Like if you, if more roads equaled more cars. So every time Moses built a road, it, it, it filled up and there were more cars. I, the opposite is true. When you make it more difficult for cars, people shift to alternatives. And by the way, we saw that on 14th Street. I mean, everyone was freaking out about the, you know, the change on 14th Street to allow the rapid buses. 14th Street is incredible right now. It's been such a success. And I knew it was going to be a success because when you make it more difficult for cars, they just kind of, they fade and people take other forms of transportation. That's the kind of thinking we need right now. Hold on one. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and just responding quickly to to Catherine in in the chat who may have a question for us. But yeah. that's that's it from our from yeah, our Q and A. Well, it's always fun to chat with you guys, and I hope I hope you'll have me back maybe in person next time. Hopefully. Yes, we would like that very much. Though I think it's probably going to be a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm I'm so I'm so grateful that you um, that you have joined us on Zoom. Um, I know that it's always um, I I like I I always appreciate the sort of big picture that you bring um, and the oh let's see we got another oh great thank you yay great okay great yeah I just. Um, I, appre I appreciate, you know, just sort of think, thinking very, thinking very carefully about the ways that the, that the past can, can give us, um, give us, you know, new, new and better ideas about a future that hopefully will not be run by folks like Robert Moses. Anymore. Exactly. That's, <laughs> that's how it's got to be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely agree. So thank you again so much. Thanks to all of you for coming and staying thank you with for us. Having me. And um, we'll see you soon. You got it, absolutely. Okay. Take care, everyone. Bye, Good night.